All right. All right, hi everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yu. Dr. Yu was a cardiac fellow here, um, as well as a heart failure fellow, and he's now starting as one of the heart failure attendings and is gonna be presenting on advanced heart failure. Hey, can you guys hear me? Thanks for the introduction, Magda. Hi to everyone who knows me. Hi to people who don't know me. Hopefully you'll rotate through heart failure. It's great rotation, guys. Don't don't listen to the rumors. Um, okay, how do I get this? So um, I was asked to, to give an introductory lecture on advanced heart failure, which is um, interesting, but it can be done. So the things that I hope to go over today are um, different concepts, and some of them. Probably the most important one is trying to figure out give you guys a better understanding of when someone transitions from regular heart failure to advanced heart failure and then um, give you guys a little bit of a, a very whirlwind introduction to all the different advanced therapies that are available at Loyola and how it's a little bit of a, a weird nomenclature of calling it advanced it's just kind of it's honestly pretty arbitrary but these things in general will include inotropes um, mechanical circulatory support, which I'll call MCS, and these can be in the flavor of something that's really temporary or something durable, and then also the greatest of all things, which is transplant. Um, I will begin by saying that a uh, little small plug for heart failure in general, like no matter what sort of cardiac disease you have, whether or not you have coronary disease, whether or not you have something wrong with your conduction system, your valves, whether or not there's something wrong with, um, unfortunately, something inherited from the family, you have constriction, you have restriction, you have sarcoid, um, you have like a hole in your heart from a gunshot wound or something, all these things, if you can survive, you know, if you survive the sudden cardiac death component of it and you live, eventually is going to make you have heart failure. Um, <clears throat> And uh, heart failure is not a good thing. So if you if you survive to that point where you have chronic heart failure, you're eventually, uh, just due to the natural history of things, you are going to progress. Um, so back to kind of what I was saying in the beginning, like you kind of have to think, it's a little bit of a weird question, you know, everyone has a good sense of, if you see someone in your clinic, it's your internal medicine clinic, it's the first time they come. Um, they're complaining of some sharpness of breath and they're just saying it's kind of weird and it's new and you eventually diagnose them with heart failure. There's, there's that outpatient patient. So everyone knows that's, you know, obviously regular basic heart failure. And then um, if you ever come to the CCU or even the MICU or any of the ICUs, you're going to see all these people in cardiogenic shock with EFs of 10% and on these drips. Sometimes they'll be ventilated. Sometimes they'll have, you know, balloon pumps, impella. Sometimes they'll be on ECMO, and those patients are obviously, you know, obviously in advanced heart failure per se. Um, but the question is, you know, when when is that transition from being a regular clinic patient to someone who's, you know, very ill in the ICU, and um, I would say that in my eyes, it probably has to do with. Um, when you start seeing the prognosis shift in things. Um, and there are a lot of different signs and things and lab values and tests that happen throughout a cardiology patient's history that can point you towards the patient having a better prognosis or whether or not they have a worse prognosis. So once you start seeing signs of things that are getting worse, whether it's a number or a symptom, um, you have to start thinking that maybe their heart failure is progressing and now they're becoming an advanced patient as opposed to you know just your regular clinic patient. Um, just to give you a little bit of data, there's not gonna be a ton of data in this, but um, you know, looking back at the prognosis of heart failure in general, this is just a Kaplan-Meier curve of one of the original trials for ACE inhibitors. Um, with the placebo being the dotted line, the malpro being the, the solid line. But you could see that it, back in the day, in like the 80s, when we didn't really know anything, didn't really use meds at all. If you had heart failure, you, were, you had a 60% chance of being dead at one year, which is horrible. And this is not even just cardiogenic shock patients. These are just a lot of patients all coming. 
on commerce. You know, if you compare that to something more contemporary, so this, this is a, a survival curve from DAPA HF, which is a trial looking at the paglifosin, one of the SGLT2 inhibitors, one of the newer categories of a GDMT that have recently been um, given to us. But um, the reason why I just highlight this is that if you look at the placebo versus the um, um, interventional group, um, even if even the placebo group survival at you know cumulative mortality at you know twelve months is down to like ten percent or twenty percent, so that's drastically different than you know the sixty percent from before. Obviously, this is a little bit of apples to oranges, and this is like one of the things that you'll you'll realize when you start reading cardiology trials is a lot of things depend on like what the baseline therapy is at that point. And the baseline standards for cardiology therapy are, you know, miles and miles, light years ahead of what they used to be literally 40 years ago now. So um, it's not as bad as it was before, but it's still pretty horrible. And a lot of it depends on how they show up. <clears throat> um, so there's, um, there's different ways to kind of classify patients with heart failure. There's all these different symptomatology gradings, and then there's the AHA stages. So um, that's one way of looking at things. So um, there's stage A, B, C, and D. And um, functionally, um, the general course of heart failure is that they're gonna present with their first admission, and then you're gonna get them better, and then they're gonna reach their baseline, maybe they'll kind of forget their meds one day and they'll come back to the hospital and you might be able to get them better. But the thing that I tell the patients is that you're, you're not necessarily gonna bounce back to 100% every single time. You know, Maybe you'll bounce back to 90% and then now 90% is your new baseline. If that happens again, you bounce back and now you're at 75% and 75% is your new baseline. Eventually it's gonna keep going down to the point where you spiral into this stage D situation. So stage C is you know, what we call symptomatic heart failure. Um, stage D is when we say someone is, is advanced in this structure. So um, it's just one way of categorizing patients. But um, again, these are very broad categories and doesn't really have a whole lot of nuance to them. Um, another way to kind of categorize things in a heart failure patient is just symptomatology. So everyone learns about the New York Heart Association classification of symptoms. I prefer to say NYHA. I do not like people saying NIHA, but whatever. Um, so whatever you want. So class one is no symptoms. Class two is mild symptoms with order activity. Class three is something where people have symptoms doing basically anything except for being at rest. And this is kind of where you're asking if, um, you know, between the class two and class three, if you're asking someone if they can walk up a flight of stairs and things like that, that's part of symptomatology. And then class four um, is when you have symptoms at rest, but again, there's a lot of different nuances, right? Like so even if you're shorter breath at rest, that's still different than someone who's you know, in the ICU intubated with a balloon pump, that's still technically class four. So you can see how it's, it's kind of limited still. Um, in the interventional world, in the cardiogenic shock world, there's another classification system, the Intermax scales, Intermax profiles, and this is probably, um, again, a lot of these are not necessarily that helpful clinically. It's a lot of it's more research based, but um, class one in Intermax is the sickest, and these are patients that are essentially coding or on ECMO, and then everything else below that or above that are slightly less sick, but the, the Intermax 7, you're already class three symptoms. And for sure, if you're any in the middle range, you're gonna be in the class four symptoms. Um, they also do a differentiation. If you look at here on the right side here, whether or not they're on inotropes or not, which is you know something that you can actually be on at home, but obviously if you need an inotrope to help you be stable at home. That's not a. That's not a good sign. It's just not, it's not really a bad sign. Um, so here I'm just telling you that the Intermax scale and the symptomatology of NYHA and then the ACCA stages they're all kind of together to try to help you classify patients into people that are more sick to less less sick to more sick rather. Um, but it's very imperfect and there's a lot of gray area in between, especially in the more sick areas like class stages C and D, symptoms class three and four and intermax, you know, 
in the higher ranges. Um, so it's not as easy as just saying class four and the person is advanced. Um, it takes a little bit more nuance than that. Um, so here's like a simple list of things where you might consider someone who's having, uh, who's progressing towards advanced heart failure. So, you know, the symptomatology is a, a tough one um, because it could just be related to, uh, you know, them eating an extra hamburger that day or something. But there are some other things that are a little bit more concerning. So if you have a patient that's um, losing weight when they have heart failure, that's often a bad sign because usually they gain weight because of the, the fluid retention. But they'll be, despite fluid retention, they'll, still, they'll be losing weight from cardiac cachexia. And that's a phenomenon in which your body is just spending so much energy trying to supply your body with oxygen from your heart that it's just expending more calories than, than you're consuming. And then patients that are um, repeat flyers, um, frequent flyers rather, um, uh, that's a sign that things aren't going well, assuming that they take their meds properly, you know, you know, you're doing everything you can with the meds, but they keep coming back. That's, that's definitely a bad sign. And then on the same vein, if you're using all these meds to the point where you're getting side effects to your kidneys and everything with diuretic resistance, CKD and whatnot, that's also kind of a sign that people are progressing towards more advanced heart failure. Um, another thing is um, if you can't even give them the medicine, uh, there's so many patients where you see them and their blood pressure is, you know, in the hundreds or the nineties or something, and you want to give them an ACE inhibitor, but you can't because it's, you know, relatively contraindicated in those patients. And that's, that's also a bad sign if you can't even give them any of the standard therapies. Laboratory wise, uh, the things that we looked at are CKD. So if they have cardio, cardio renal syndrome, um, elevated LTs is a sign of hepatic congestion or right heart failure. And, you know, BMP is your classic, um, cardiac biomarker, troponin, hyponatremia, hype, so people with heart failure get hypervolemic hyponatremia, um, very common. And the low albumin kind of goes with cardiac cachexia because they're just very malnutrition. And um, one of the more objective markers that we use more consistently is something called the peak VO2, which is, uh, which is a number you get from the cardiopulmonary stress test. And um, less than, you know, a normal, just so you have the normal is probably like above 30 or so, if, if you were ever to do it. But uh, below 14 has been a very, very bad prognostic marker um, in patients. Um, this was released by the, the ISHLT. So interestingly, the advanced heart failure, we follow international guidelines. We don't follow just the AHA or something like the ISHLT is an international guideline. But they, they let out this thing that I think is kind of a pretty contrived acronym. I need help. But <laughs> all these are obvious signs that this happens to your patient. It's not good. It's pretty intuitive, right? If someone needs an inotropes, that's a bad sign. If someone is getting shocked from the defibrillator, that's a bad sign. If someone is, um, you know, their EGF is going down and down and down, that's a bad sign. If their other organs aren't working, that's also a bad sign. Um, the more, the more kind of less obvious ones that people don't think about, I would say are probably like the repeat hospitalizations, the diuretic resistance and the lack of being able to tolerate GDMT. Those are things that, you know, you might see as a brand new heart failure patient in, in gen med. And you might think like, hmm, I wanna give this to him, but I can't, but it's his first time here. You're like, oh, well, whatever. Um, I would say that he already has a sign that his heart failure is more advanced than you appreciate. Just because it's his first presentation does not mean that it's, that it's not advanced, okay. Um, hopefully these guys are gonna be referred to cardiology and eventually referred to, to us. Um, any quick questions about, you know, what makes the patient more advanced? You know, it's kind of nuanced, but it just has to do with, you know, progressively more signs of bad things happening to them. You know, objectively, there's data for every single one of these things here. There's a, there's a trial that says that the patient who has this has a worse prognosis. Now, that's where the data comes from. But, like, you don't really need that, that to get the sense that someone is declining. Okie dokie. So what would I call a, a basic heart failure therapy as opposed to an advanced heart therapy? So um, hopefully you guys can sear into your mind GDMT. So 
anytime you go into cardiology rotation, we're going to ask you about the beta blockers, the ACE inhibitors, the MRIs, the ARNIs, so Entresto, and then the new thing on the block is going to be the SGLT2 inhibitors, just so you, just FYI, as of 2021, that's actually made it into the guidelines, so that is, that is something you're class one supposed to do now, as opposed to it being, you know, something suggested. Other things that um, should be considered in everyone are um, trying to fix the conduction system as best you can. Um, this is irrespective of the ICD. So things like cardiac, um, uh, CRT rather. Um, revascularization. So if someone has coronary disease, obviously you want to try to fix that as best you can, whether or not it's with a stent or whether it's with the cabbage, CV surgery, and then if they have alveolar disease similarly, um, we gotta ask CV surgery colleagues to help out with that, or we could potentially try to do something percutaneously. Um, so this is in contrast to advanced therapies. It's kind of a, a little bit of a weird weird categorization, but when, when we talk about it in cardiology, when we say, when someone is referred to me, the specific thing they're referring me for is transplant and BADS, so ventricular assistive devices. That's what we mean in general, but in practice, there's a bunch of other things that lead up to it that are kind of more serious and more ICU level, and those include things like balloon pumps, ECMO, impellas, and inotropes and vasopressors, those types of things. Uh, I would still say that those are like more, you know, escalated therapies, but um, just in terms of just like nomenclature and like just what we mean when we say advanced therapies, it is basically it's, um, asking for the bad or transplant. So if you do a consult to us, that's kind of, if that's your question, like, is he a candidate for advanced therapies? What you're really asking is, can he get a transplant? Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, durable. Um, so like mechanical circulatory support. So there's things that are machines that you can stick into a patient to help support their blood pressure and cardiac output that are temporary and things that they are meant to leave the hospital with. Um, so here is just a very short case example. So we have a 51 year old female with dilated cardiomyopathy presenting with worsening heart failure to your clinic. She is on these medications, which is not terrible. Um, her age 70, her blood pressure is 95 or 60. She looks volume overloaded. Um, what, oh, okay, sorry. So there's an echo that I put in here. Okay, for those of you who don't read echo, this is an, an apical four chamber view. So this is the, so the probe is up here. So your sternum and your, or your chest walls up here. Um, this is the left ventricle with the apex. This is the left atrium. In between here, in between the left ventricle and the left atrium is the mitral valve. So you'll see it you know, open towards the LV cavity. Over here, you see the sliver of the RV. So it's a little bit rotated, this image. And then obviously down here is gonna be the RA in between here is um, gonna be the tricuspid valve. You do not see the aortic valve. Um, or the pulmonic valve in this image. Um, you can also see a little bit of the, the pericardium around here. Anyways, but um, the point of this image is to show that it's not pumping very well. It says it's probably you know, 15, 25% um, ejection fraction. This is her EKG. I have left the right, the read up here. Normal sinus rhythm, left bundle branch block, left access deviation, the cure restoration is 170. Anyway, so what should we do? Um, add another medicine, switch to last interval and Tresto, upgrade CRT, transplant that palliative care. Um, so the reason why I, I even have this case up here is, um, So I'm trying to point out the left one brush up here. Um, the answer is uh, is going to be probably CRT for this patient. The reason why I have this here is because of just because you know transplant and bad are an option to do things. It's 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 not something we want to do right away. It's it's pretty much 
the last line, right? Obviously, replacing your heart with someone else's heart is going to be the last thing that we're going to do in our armamentarium of, of medical things that we can do. If we can put in a stent to fix something, if we can put in a device to fix something, or just even more simply give them a medicine to try to fix something, obviously, that's going to be <clears throat> a lot more, more, a lot less morbid for the patient. Um, Uh, but I do uh, hope that is kind of a concept that that people kind of go away with in general. Like before someone gets a VAT or a transplant, we try to do all the quote unquote basic things that we can to try to help the patient that are available uh, within the spectrum of cardiology. And then it's not until only we've, we've explored all these things do we try to go to the more extreme things because it is it is kind of extreme, you know, putting in a machine in someone's heart and having them be permanently plugged to a battery pack for the you know for the rest of their foreseeable life is is extreme, you know, and having committing someone to taking immunosuppression and risking that portion of disease is also you know considered extreme. Um, okay. So now let's go over a little bit of the advanced therapies portion. So this is going to be very, um, um, very kind of a, a whirlwind tour. So inotropes are probably the mainstay first line things that we're going to give to people when we think that they're kind of declining. So um, if someone keeps going in to the hospital and you're thinking that they're going to be an advanced heart failure, uh, we do a right cart cath to confirm that we measure their we actually measure their cardiac output and it's low you know below two maybe it's like 1.5 or something or one um cardiac index rather um one of the first things that we're going to try to do unless they're you know crashing and burning is to try to give them an anisotrope that just makes their cardiac output go up to see if um uh, to see if that's going to help them feel better if it's going to improve their organ function their diuresis you know their blood pressure all that stuff um i don't know how much i see you guys have done or at ccu but um there are definitely favored inotropes in the cardiology world but um this is kind of how i think about things when i'm using um pressors in general in, in the ccu so i, I divide the these drugs these drugs and drips and so I know pressors, I know dilators, and pure vasopressors. Um, so the I know pressors are probably the ones that you are going to be using the most, especially no epi. Um, unfortunately, these receptor things are, are is going to be something you, you have to memorize to be able to use these things properly. It's just impossible to pick the right one without under, like knowing what the receptors are, um, what you're expecting. Um, so in general, just as a review, alpha is uh, vasoconstriction, peripheral vasoconstriction, and this kind of ends up increasing your afterload or your blood pressure. Beta-1 is the one that we want in cardiology. Um, this is the thing that increases inotropy, which is a, another way of saying it makes your heart pump stronger, stronger, so it increases contractility. And then beta-1 also makes your SA node fire faster, so that also increases chronotropy. Um, so it'll increase your heart rate. And remember, cardiac output is a combination of your stroke volume and also your heart rate. So if you're increasing both those things via beta-1 agonism, um, you're going to increase your cardiac output. Okay. Um, norepinephrine also does something, the same thing as epi, except it has a greater slant on alpha agonism, rather. Um, dopamine... Um, is interesting because it has a dose dependent effect so we actually don't like to use this that much but uh we do for usually for heart rate i would say um but well, much less so in the cases of cardiogenic shock uh, mostly because there's a trial showing that we should not do that um, specifically with dopamine um okay I know dilators is the thing that we, we typically do use for cardiology and that's dobutamine and melanone. So dobutamine hits beta one and beta two is the beta one we talked about is the, is the magic that we really like. But beta two is something we also like in cardiology because it causes peripheral vasodilation. Um, and the reason why we like vasodilation is because it reduces something called afterload. And in cardiology, like the hemodynamics that we talk about, are going to be related to the cardiac output, the index, the 
and the afterload, the things that are, um, and the preload. So the, the things that are pumping, the heart is pumping against, you know, how much volume the heart is pumping with, and then how hard the heart is pumping by itself. So if you have, um, if you increase the afterload, which is the SVR, or just the pure blood pressure in someone, the heart has to work harder to pump against that. It's using more energy, which is bad in the sense that um, it causes your heart to expend more energy. And in most cases, that's not something we want because we're trying to um, not tax the heart any more than, than needed. Um, so in theory, if we can reduce SBR, reduce the afterload of the heart um, with an inodilator, dilator, that could potentially help things as well. And then this last category, vasopressors, is the category that we almost always avoid. It's not an absolute rule because, you know, even though we don't want the blood pressure to be like, you know, 100, 150 or something, we also don't want the blood pressure to be like 40 over 30, you know, because that's not compatible with life. Sometimes you just got to do something to, to make the person live in, the, in that minute, in that second. So final effort is pure alpha agonism, which I said was, remember, just uh, pure peripheral vasoconstriction, which is an afterload thing. And then vasopressin hits its own receptor and also has basically pure, pure afterload increase. This is the worst thing, in theory, one of the worst things possible to give in cardiogenic shock um, because it doesn't even, doesn't increase inotropy or chronotropy at all, right? There's no mechanistic reason for it. So um, you will rarely see these being used in, in the CCU. Um, oh, um, one thing to note is that these anodilators are, can be given at home. So they can be given as a continuous infusion. So patients that we start on these things and we find out that they're dependent on them, like we try to wean them off later and they get worse, you know, that demonstrates that they need this. They need this to make their heart function properly. We can actually set them up with a, a little pump fanny pack thing that they send them, they go home with. Um, okay, so any questions about the inotropes? Mainly, these are the two that I care about that are the most used. Good. Um, so next, I'll be talking about uh, mechanical circulatory support. So um, kind of a little bit analogous to, uh, you know, it's a little bit, you know, what I said before about not trying to work your heart when your heart is in shock. Um, like when your heart is having a heart attack and it needs more oxygen, um, you're trying to do things that, that rest it, you know, to reduce the oxygen demand. And, you know, it, it's a little bit counterintuitive because we're, when we give, when we give someone an inotrope, we're actually kind of whipping the heart like a horse. It's not, we're not necessarily resting it per se, but it's kind of a, a less invasive thing that we do at this point. Um, mechanical circular deport is, is something a little bit more optimal, but it carries more risk in the sense that you have to actually stick something external, internally into the patient. So this is, would be like something more analogous to like a ventilator and like ARDS patients, you know, trying to you know, rest your lungs because the ventilator can, in theory, you know, take the work away from your lungs. Um, the mechanical portion of of, of MCS and cardiology can take, can actually reduce the work of the heart, which is something, um, theoretically more positive. So that there are temporary things where we kind of stick, the, stick them in in the acute setting. And then there are things that people can actually go home with. So the temporary things are going to be the entry of the boom pump, the impella. There's something called a tandem heart, which I'll show you a picture of. Uh, there's also something called a protect duo. And um, the most extreme and aggressive is, is, is ECMO. Here at Loyola, I would say that we majorly do um, the IABP, the balloon pump, impellas, and ECMO. CV surgery handles the ECMO, cardiology handles these two things at, at this institution. We do also do a protect duos, but very rarely. We do not do tandem parts. Um, durable NCS, so things that last. Um, are things that you can go home with. So the main thing that we do is called the VAD. It could be an LVAD on the left side. It could also technically be an RVAD on the right side of the heart too. Um, and then there's something called the TAH or the total artificial heart, which is um, something I'll also describe a little bit for you guys, but it, it is not something we do here at Loyola. 
Um, okay, so intraerotic balloon pump. Anyone who goes to CCU, you're gonna see a bunch of these. Um, it's like the classic um, MCS, temporary MCS that's been around since the 1960s, I think. Um, invented by the same dude that did the first heart transplant here. But basically it's a balloon that um, inflates and deflates in the aorta. And it functions through um, a mechanism or concept called aortic counterpulsation. So it's called counterpulsation because it's inflating during uh, diastole and deflating during systole. Um, so what is so what does that do for you? Um, so if you look at this kind of picture here, if you can imagine during diastole, the heart is is not pumping, right? The heart is not pumping, the aortic valve is closed. So when the balloon inflates here, it's gonna be pushing blood. It's gonna be dis displacing the blood that was here where the balloon was deflated before. All that blood um, that was in this little column here is, has to be displaced um, somewhere because the balloon is now taking up that space. So some of the blood is gonna be pushed up this way and some of the blood is gonna be pushed down this way. We mostly care about the blood that's pushed up this way. Um, so this augments the diastolic pressure. So it increases the diastolic pressure. Um, and that's important for a couple of things, but one of the, the main things is that it improves the coronary perfusion pressure of the heart. Um, and this is often really important because um, remember the heart, the LV at least fills in, in diastole, the coronaries at least, left coronaries. Um, and a lot of these patients are coming in after a heart attack or something, and they need as much oxygen as they can through the coronaries, and this is one way to get it. Um, during systole, there's rapid deflation. So if you can imagine, if you're deflating something really, really quickly within a tube, it's going to cause a vacuum, and that vacuum causes a suction effect. So the heart is actually squeezing in the sense, so it's during systole, so the, the heart is ejecting blood forward. And at the same time, the balloon is deflating rapidly, causing a vacuum over here. So the blood is gonna kind of be a little bit sucked down forward. And um, what that does is that it decreases afterload, which is again, something that we feel like is important because it again, decreases the amount of work that the heart has to do. We're trying to rest the heart in this context. So the combined, um, the combined effect of of aortic counterpulsation, pulsation, the inflation during diastole and the deflation during systole is that it improves cardiac output and rests the heart. Um, interestingly, like uh, the the amount of cardiac output it actually provides is probably only like half to one liter per minute per se, and your normal cardiac output for a human is going to be you know more like five to eight, but it's you know it's better than nothing. Um, and it's also relatively easy to put in. So it's, it's, it's considered a relatively simple MCS intervention. Um, the impella is a little bit more advanced. Um, it's, it's similar to a, more like a VAD. And this is a little bit more aggressive because it's bigger. Um, and one theme that I want you guys to take away is that it, the more support something to give, the more like the more work that it can take over. The, the higher risk there is. So obviously the highest risk thing is gonna be ECMO because it can, it can do everything for body. It can oxygenate, it can also completely circulate um, your blood and support your blood pressure. Uh, but the consequence of that is that there's a lot of risk and morbidity to, if, to that uh, system. Um, I'm gonna show you this guys, just because it's, see. just because it is something you do and I think it's important to understand. The Impella 2.5 and CP are microaxial catheter pumps that can be inserted via a peripheral artery using standard cath lab techniques. Once positioned across the aortic valve, the Impella heart pump actively unloads the heart by pumping blood from the left ventricle into the ascending aorta. This has the effect of increasing aortic pressure, augmenting and supporting blood flow to the sensitive peripheral organs while unloading and protecting the native heart. Okay, I just kind of wanted to show you that this is kind of how it looks. 
So it's pulling blood from the left ventricle and dumping it out into the aorta, uh, which is why it's sort of similar to fat per se. Um, and usually this is our second thing that we go to once we feel like the balloon pump's not working very well and the inertials, of course. Sometimes we jump straight to this because it's, you know, if you do a right cat cap and you're measuring the cardiac output and it's, it's like 0.5 or something, then definitely adding another 0.5 from your balloon pump is not going to do anything, right? It's, it's still going to be horrendously low. Um, echo, ECMO is one of the more extreme things. This is, um, in, in cardiology, we're talking about VA ECMO, not VV ECMO. So this is something that completely um, takes away the work of, of the heart per se. Unfortunately, it does have its drawbacks, but um, it, is, it is a form of temporary mechanical support that, that we do. Um, here's kind of an illustration of the differences of some. Um, You'll notice that they're all potentially percutaneous. Um, here, I think CV0 does do, do cut downs for, for ECMO in their case. And these cannulas can be different. Like conceptually, you're taking, you're just taking blood from the venous side somewhere, and then you're dumping it into the arterial side somewhere. And most commonly it's gonna be the femoral vein and the femoral artery, but that does not have to be the case. Um, the tandem heart is, is similar to ECMO, but instead of taking uh, blood just from the femoral vein or the, or the right atrium, it's going to be uh, crossing into the left atrium, um, which involves a little bit another step per se, but um, it's just another system that can provide circulatory support. Um, you can also put these in the RV side. So, you know, anyone who's familiar with the PER program here or the PE program here, um, sometimes these are things that we sometimes do, usually in patients with massive PE per se, or intermediate PE. Um, I'm calling these bridging therapies because uh, again, these are temporary and we use them as a bridge to get them to somewhere else, like their transplant or their bad. Uh, okay, so the durable section here, there's the VAD and total artificial heart. Um, why do we, why do we do the VAD? You know, obviously it's to improve survival. You know, back in the day, in the early 2000s, when these first went in, um, survival in patients with like really bad cardiac shock and CZ was, was, was awful, right? Um, and improving that to 25% is great. It's still awful, but it's great compared to 8%, you know, at two years. And nowadays, in the more contemporary trials, we're closer to probably in the 75 to 80% survival in two years, um, which is, um, I put this uh, heart transplant survival at two years kind of as an illustration. It's kind of, kind of competes a little bit with the heart transplant at two years, but you know, long-term survival is still different, right? Um, heart transplant is still the king in terms of long-term survival, uh, but in the two-year mark, maybe there is a little bit of comparison that you can be made between a bad and transplant. Um, obviously, it improves quality of life, otherwise we wouldn't do this. Uh, here's an example of one of the first fads that we did. It's kind of like a, like a chimney smoker thingy. We don't have these anymore. It had too many moving parts that it kind of broke all the time. Then we moved into the era of continuous flow LVADs. So this is the heart made two. It has a rotor that kind of sucks blood continuously in this axial formation. So it's taking blood from the left ventricle. You know, it's sucking through this pump and it dumps it into the aorta. Um, so you're basically bypassing the work of the left ventricle, which is what we need to do because all these patients, their left ventricles do not work properly. Um, you can see that all these VADs, there's a power cord that sticks out of their abdomen and it's connected to a battery pack. Um, at some point we're gonna get wireless VADs, but we're not quite there yet. Um, more contemporary VADs, the HVAD and the HeartMate 3 are centrifugal um, and they're also still continuous, but the only difference is that they're pulling blood this way and the blood is being ejected at a 90 degree angle as opposed to here, which is being injected kind of like in a straight line. Um, anyway, so this is the most contemporary pump here, the HeartMate 3. Uh, here's kind of what they look like in real life, um, the actual instruments. Uh, if anyone's interested, these are the trials that they kind of did to get them approved for um, destination therapy and also bridge to transplant. 
Um, of note, this year they actually discontinued the HVAS. So now the only um, LVAS that are on market now are going to be um, the HeartMate 3 and I think the HeartMate 2, but mostly everyone's doing HeartMate 3 these days. And there isn't um, much of a choice, frankly, at this juncture. We used to be an HVAS center mostly. We did a couple HeartMate 3s, but now obviously we're switching to HeartMate 3s. Um, VADs are pretty complicated. And I, I'm sure, like, um, once you wrote the cardiology, there's going to be a dedicated VAD lecture that I may potentially give once a month or something like that. Um, but um, the things that we can look at the VAD are, you know, we can set how many. RPMs it spins at, which is kind of indirectly related to how many liters per minute of flow. So you notice that it can provide, you know, can provide up to 10 liters per minute of flow, which is, you know, arguably greater than <laughs> some normal people. You can also measure like how much power it's sucking through the wall socket. Um, the LVADs, there are complications. So it's not a free lunch, a free machine. There's definitely problems with having this mechanical pump in your left ventricle. And it has to do with um, having a big piece of metal with a bunch of parts in it. And I think the biggest risk is having clots in there because if you have a clot in that, in that pump, if it dislodges, it's gonna go somewhere. And the worst place it can go is gonna be your brain and cause a stroke. Um, so we try to mitigate that risk with anticoagulation, but the problem is if you anticoagulate someone, they're also going to be more likely to bleed, so there's going to be a lot of GI bleeding issues. With the physiology of the VAT itself, there's also uh, risks, there's other risks related to increased GI bleeding, like formation of AVMs, you know, if you have a um, if you have a drive line that comes out, obviously there's going to be an infection there, um, and there's some other things that that we have to look at. Uh, I'm just showing you this table just because um, the incidence of these uh, complications is very high. So somewhere like, you know, 50 or 60% of patients with the VAT is, are going to bleed at some point. Maybe 10% of patients are going to have a, some sort of stroke. And then some patients, you know, maybe like 3% of patients are going to have like a terrible stroke. Um, so this is not a benign, benign thing, but again, it's probably better than certain alternatives. Um, I'm just showing you this picture because I'm just letting you guys know that this technology does exist. It's called a total artificial heart. Um, basically, they, they resect the left and right ventricle and replace them completely with pumps. It's like having two VADs at the same time, but uh, they remove most of the ventricle instead of um, just sticking them in. Uh, transplant considerations. Um, so just because you want a transplant doesn't mean everyone can get a transplant. You know, you have to see like, how long you're going to live. You know, if they have pulmonary hypertension, because we're just replacing your heart, we're not replacing your lungs. Um, if they're too old, if they're like 80, it doesn't really make sense to give them a heart transplant. If they have a bunch of other problems with them, like cancer or chronic infection, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to give them a transplant, mostly because of the immunosuppression. Um, there's a lot of social factors that come into contact, uh, come into play with transplants. So if someone doesn't have someone there to help them or they don't know how to take meds, you know, that might be okay if, you know, in your clinic, if, they, if it's like a third year old who doesn't want to take his meds for his, I don't know, for his UTI or something. But if you miss your immunosuppression with your transplant, you're going to reject and your transplant is going to, to fail and you're potentially going to go back into cardiogenic shock. And, um, and there's a little bit of like moral consideration there because like you have to, you have to get an organ from someone else, right? If you, you don't want to, Want it to go to waste per se. Um, in terms of the number of transplants, um, this is also a sticking point because the number of organs are limited. So the transplants are limited by how many donors there are. So in North America, we're probably stuck around 3,000 to 3,500 transplants per year. It's been like that for the past 10, 15 years. We're trying to find ways of um, Increasing that by taking, you know, people with Hep C or Hep B or things like that, or potentially even taking um, people who have died. Um, typically, the donors are going to be brain dead, but there are um, new, interesting ways of trying to get an organ. Um, again, here going back to the, the theme of prognosis, transplant is still king in terms of long-term survival for heart 
for failure. So at this juncture, back in 2002 to 2009, we were at a median survival of 12 and a half years. So it's probably even a little bit higher now, I would say. So um, it's pretty good. It's, it's even longer if you're a kid. So organ allocation is its own special thing. Just because you're on the list doesn't mean you're gonna get it. The list is based on how sick you are. Um, the, sickest, um, the sickest patients are highest on the list. Uh, the least sick patients are the lowest on the list. If you or I to be on this list, we could be on this list, uh, but we would be status six, which means that even if we were a status six for 30 years, the guy up with status five, who's been on status five for one second is gonna get a heart before you, okay? So that, that's how the statuses work. The accrued time in one status only trumps people within the same status rank. So if I was in the list for 30 years, but Magda was on the list for 31 years, then she would get it before me. But if I got sicker and moved to status five, then I would get something before her. Um, transplants have a lot of complications, mostly related to the immunosuppression, so opportunistic infections. There's a lot of renal failure out there. Um, you can also get PTLD or cancer post-transplant related to the infection. And then the things that we're trying to, to avoid with the, trans with the immunosuppression are rejection, cellular and antibody mediated. And then there's also chronic rejection in the form of something called cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Um, this is just to show you that um, the rates of these things are not uncommon. Um, and the point of it is that it's, it's, it's um, not a rare thing. It's not like a, a perfect uh, system. Um, so with this slide, I'm just trying to say that uh, when people with an advanced heart failure in the CCU or even the clinic, they're on something temporary to kind of support them whether it's a bloom palm, whether it's an inotrope, they could be an inotrope in the CCU, or they could be an inotrope at home, but that stuff is, is basically buying them time. It's acting as a bridge to kind of figure out what we're gonna do. Um, so while we're in that little short time frame, we're trying to figure out what's going on, um, we have to see if they're gonna be a, trans, a transplant or a bad candidate, right? Because if we you know, scan their body and discover all of a sudden they have metastatic cancer, it doesn't really make sense to do anything else, right? And that's the person that might go to palliative care. But uh, if we don't find anything and the patient's agreeable, because it's a huge commitment, once you get a transplant or a VAD, you're, essentially your whole life revolves around that thing. So you're, you're, paying, you're paying extra life for, for this extra care. So when you're trading your advanced chronic heart failure disease for a transplant, you're really kind of trading diseases. You're, now you have the disease of having a transplant, unfortunately. Um, so takeaways, just kind of keep an eye out of signs that someone's worse than you think they are. You should refer to cardiology or heart failure sooner rather than later. Um, colloquially, when we say advanced therapies, we do in general specifically mean that in transplant. And then um, there are a lot of things that can help us get there, but they can't just, we can't do those things indefinitely. Those are temporary things. We have to make a decision while they're being supported. Um, and even if they cross all those bridges and you know pass all those, jump through all those hoops, um, the management afterwards is still, is still very complex and not without difficulty. That's it. Questions? No one's typing in the chat? Thanks, guys. Thanks. You're the one arranging all these lectures. Mm -hmm.